Adritiya 200 Mbps speed deka ke. Sri Lanka ve vegavat masaha pulul tama home broadband sambandh tabe vana. SLT Mobitel deshe fiber bala vege opat adam atvidinna. Hari masudui. First at 9 this Friday, the 18th of August, 2023. Modernization. Novel approach to be developed to optimize the operations of local government authorities, provincial councils and the central government, says President Ranil Vikramasinghe. No more. State Minister of Finance expressed confidence in saying no to a 17th IMF program. The IMF is also in the view that this should be the last IMF program that Sri Lanka should enter highlights the necessity of reforms. If you have a monetary policy committee, why not a tax policy committee? My fervent request is all political parties is the next year is election year. Is don't auction assets that don't exist. Having these strict austerity measures, it is very, very difficult for any country to come out with this kind of difficult situation. Sooner than later, Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna requests the President to hold the local government elections as soon as possible. Obey Vishwasi Dino Sinsurain, then Lagamati Pharmacy in Labaka the Hacker. Rhino Cement Roofing Sheets, Ulama Milata Kal Pavati Navaharak. Ada Verana first at nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to Other Derana First at 9. I'm Aditya Dhrisingha joining you live with the latest in Sri Lanka and around the world. Now in your top story tonight, President Ranil Vikramasinghe emphasized on a novel approach aimed at optimizing operations of the local government authorities, provincial councils and the central government. These remarks were made by the President while drawing attention to the financial inefficiencies of all three tiers of administration. Meanwhile, President Vikramasinghe also instructed officials to collaborate with the provincial governors and the chief secretaries to draft a comprehensive report on the matter within a month. A meeting under the chairmanship of President Ranil Vikramasinghe was held yesterday at the presidential secretariat with the participation of the provincial governors and the chief secretaries. At the meeting, the president announced the development of a novel approach aimed at optimizing the operations of the local government authorities, provincial councils and the central government, all geared towards curbing financial inefficiencies. now, General Secretary of the Sri Lanka Pudijana Peramuna Sagar Kari Vasam requested the President to take action to remove legal barriers which prevent leaders of provincial councils from participating in social activities through their candidacy, adding that elections must be held if not. Following a meeting with the President on the matter, parliamentarians of the Sri Lanka Pudijana Peramuna Sanjeev Edrimana said those in his party do not need to forcefully be retained as they are committed to working for the party. Earlier today, a discussion between President Ranil Vikramasinghe and the former chiefs of local government authorities representing the SLPP was held at the Presidential Secretariat. Meanwhile, 
එම බාධාව ඉවත් කර දෙන්න නොයසේ නම් හැකිකමට පළාත් පාලන ඡන්ද විමසීම පවත්වන්න කියන ඉල්ලීම අපි ජනාධිපතිතුමාගෙන් කරා. බැසිල් රාජපක්ෂ මහත්තයාත් ආවද අද? නෑ නෑ බැසිල් රාජපක්ෂ මහත්තුමා සම්බන්ධ වෙච්ච රැස්වීමක් නෙමෙයි මේක. මේ ක්‍රියාකාරී අය නෑ තව දුරටත් ඔබතුමන් ළඟව රඳවා තබා ගැනීමට ඉදිරි මැතිවරණ සඳහා කරන වැඩපිළිවෙලක් නේද මේ? නෑ නෑ ඒ කාටවත් ලණු දාලා කම දාලා බැඳින්න තියාගන්න අවශ්‍ය නෑ. ඒ සියලු දෙන අධ්‍යාත්මිකව දේශපාලනිකව පක්ෂයත් එක්ක බැඳිලා ඉන්නේ. යන්න ඉන්න ඇයි ගිහිල්ලා ඉවරයි. මේ අය අවංකව අපිත් එක්ක දේශපාලනය කරන්නේ නෑ. මොකද ජනාධිපතිතුමා මේ පිළිබඳව ගන්න තීරණය? තුමා කිව්වේ මේක නීතියානුකූලව පාර්ලිමේන්තුව නැත්නම් විවස්සාදායක මැදිහත් වීමක් මත අපි ගත යුතු හොඳම තීන්දුව ගමු කියලා. Now Sri Lanka Business Chamber representatives urged authorities to focus on opening up markets and revising laws that prevent local firms and foreign investors from doing business in the country. Speaking to Indivari Amuatta this week at Hyde Park on other than 24, Chairman of the National Chamber of Exporters Jayanth Karunaratne expressed views on the removal of simplified value added tax which exempts businesses from paying VAT in a business to business transaction and pointed out that authorities must bring in a system to pay back to businesses in order to protect the liquidity of firms meanwhile joining the discussion director of the federation of chambers of commerce and industry of sri lanka abbas abbas kamrudin and chief economist at the ceylon chamber of commerce shiran fernando said the country should focus on an economic recovery path led by small to medium scale industries while also focusing on the ease of doing business to enable direct investments to sri lanka representing each of the chambers what do we need to go ahead with in terms of domestic regulation and do away with now you know with regard to from the national chamber of exporters we are concerned about this uh, removal of svat mm -hmm. and bringing in vat next year so actually we are not against it but you know what we want is if you start collecting that there has to be a proper mechanism to pay back because we have had very bad experiences some are uh, trying to get more than billions of rupees from those vat money so without proper system of paying back the the vat collected i think it's going to make a big uh, you know difference to us mm -hmm. because it's going to block our liquidity and we will not be able to continue our usual uh, volume of business and the next thing the ease of doing business is very important to us they should very seriously look at it you know as a local company working with the local setup we find it very difficult there are laws regulations which are very old to get those things passed is not very easy taking lot of time and you know we spend lot of money lot of executive time to get those approvals we know those are not needed so i think there should be someone who should sit and check whether those are needed now some of things are very old world has changed industry has changed but still we are following them the ease of doing business is something you know at the highest level they should look into it because i don't know whether they are aware that we are going through these difficulties the three core mandates of the federation is to drive sme led growth for the economy two is to help more and more industrialists to crop up in sri lanka and reducing our imports dependency wherever possible and the third one is to help sri lankan ventures to expand globally we need to get more and more industrialists to really look at going internationally of course the foundations need to be laid for that in terms of to achieve these three objectives we have uh, kind of devised uh, a seven pillar strategy including uh, entrepreneurial development including uh, access to finance access to capital for these entrepreneurs policy frameworks addressing policy frameworks uh, human capital development that's an absolute must as well as uh, you know addressing the sustainable development goals which uh, you know opens up so many markets and new opportunities uh, for sri lankan entrepreneurs as well as basically uh, seeing how we could use digital economy the digital yeah. economy element of is is absolutely important because that's the industry fourth industrial revolution and we need to make sure that that is inculcated well into the economy i think we've kind of stabilized we've come to a, a tipping point in that sense to go forward you really need to unlock growth and and that growth has to be linked to the different reforms that we were talking about uh, the other thing we've been really uh, looking at is of course the debt restructuring process which i think uh, now has progressed and hopefully uh, by september october there'll be positive news both from our bilateral and and uh, some of our bondholders as well so if those positivity comes in we unlock the second tranch of the ima program i think the stability uh, period that we're having can continue to continue it you really need 
growth oriented reforms because if you look if you even look at the last uh, decade or more we've had maybe two to three IMF programs is because we do the initial macro stabilization measures for the economy but we don't couple it with the structural reforms that are required uh, we're seeing early signs of it I mean if you look at something that is really an issue for the private sector is in terms of the labor laws now you have a proposed labor uh, bill that is is looking to amalgamate a lot of the legislations because there's multiple legislations uh, there's lack of recognition for new things like part-time contract flexible work which service industry for example requires um, and also uh, being more friendly to uh, have more women also in the labor force which is something which has been a hindrance and not really a pro-growth um, initiative as well so we're seeing elements of the reform progress which we should have done 20 years ago which we're now doing uh, to complement an IMA program and I think the important thing is to see these through uh -huh. otherwise in three four years time we might have to go back to the IMF might have to go and restructure our debt again. Now State Minister of Finance Shehan Semasinghe is confident that Sri Lanka will not embark on another IMF program after ensuring the successful implementation of the current extended fund facility arrangement of 2.9 billion dollars adding that the government has learned from the crisis. Addressing a panel discussion in Colombo, the Finance State Minister said Sri Lanka will be able to achieve better levels of stabilization towards the end of this year, pointing out that the successful completion of the first IMF progress review will help the island boost investor confidence. A conference and panel discussion themed Unlocking the Power of Taxes organized by the Cross-Party Youth Initiative Next Gen SL was held recently in Colombo. This year's expenditure is budgeted at about 1.3 trillion for salaries of public servants. Another 1.3 trillion is for welfare, which includes Samurudhi, health, education, goods and services, what you purchase those areas, about another 1.3 million. So both together is about 2.6 trillion. So I think the estimate for this year is about 2.7, 2.8 trillion. So up to that point, we are okay. Because our income expected this year from all these sources of taxation is around 3.2 trillion. But whether we get there is a the question, but I think we might end up maybe 80%, hopefully 75 to 80% close to that figure. At 2.8 trillion, we are lucky if we get that figure. So I think after a long time, the first six months, the Honorable Minister, we are having a surplus of the primary account side surplus. But where have we gone wrong is on the interest cost. Our interest cost is about another 2.3 trillion for this year. So moment you bring the interest cost in, you have a huge budget deficit. So our income cannot support the budget, the interest cost. About 70% of our income goes by interest alone at the current rates. The only relief we can, I see, is that we can get on the interest expenditure we are paying. If the, only if the interest relief is given by the creditors, can we bridge the budget deficit? Otherwise, we are going to have this problem for a longer time. But even collecting authorities need modernization. Our push, I think the government is also looking at it very strongly, is to push for the digitalization of the revenue collecting authorities. My fervent request is to all political parties is the next year is election year. Is don't auction assets that you don't exist, the assets that you don't earn. Please don't come and promise that I'll give fertilizer free, I'll increase the allowance from 10,000 to 50,000 rupees. If you do that, we go back to where we were. We cannot afford to go through the financial crisis. Sri Lanka's expenditures are unbelievable. Expenditure on defense is more than 10%. The highest in all of Asia, 14 years after a conflict. When we talk about cutting you know, expenditures in public service, in defense and all, really why we need to put it in human resources. Move from hard infrastructure to soft infrastructure. When the education and health is unbelievably low, 1%, 1.5% of GDP. If you look at our comparative advantage, it's our location and it has to be our human resources. If you have a monetary policy committee, why not the tax policy committee? Why restrict it just to the finance minister and the finance ministry in any country for a given period? We need continuity in this. So why not a tax policy committee where the intellectuals can come and debate and argue with politicians like myself and then decide whether something is feasible or not. And some of them have to have a long-term trajectories. Let's have a single revenue collection authority. 75% of all the country's revenue comes from inland revenue, customs and excise. Now why did IMF wanted to have a positive primary balance? Because they also may have some calculations and understanding that within the prevailing system, governance system, weaknesses and all those things, it is extremely difficult to stabilize the other things. So that is why they went ahead with revenue-based fiscal consolidation. Thereby, they asked us to manage your expenses based on your revenue. 
How is it going to be done? So one way is to increase or collect more revenue. But we know that due to the prevailing system, with the existing system, it is hard. Therefore, it is easy for any government to turn toward the general public. Therefore, we go for unnecessary austerity measures. So having these strict austerity measures, it is very, very difficult for any country to come out with this kind of difficult situation. So it's a development to come up to this level there were a lot of reforms re uh, required. But unfortunately, we had to wait for the 17th IMF program to seriously think about these reforms and implement those reforms. So now it is a time for us to have a consistent policy. And when we were discussing the last uh, time with the IMF, the IMF is also in the view that this should be the last IMF program that Sri Lanka should enter. So if we follow the guidelines of the framework, what we have agreed upon, the staff level agreement and the board approval, and the discussions what we carry on with our creditors, we are also very confident that we may not require another IMF program for stabilization of the economy. We believe that by the end of December 2023, we will see a very much reasonable stabilization. We have taken all measures to control government expenditure. But unfortunately, we cannot control the interest payments until the debt restructuring process is finalized and until confidence is built on the economy of Sri Lanka. We still don't have access to the capital markets overseas. So once we regain access, the pressure will ease down and we'll be able to manage the economy in a better flow. We are just ahead of the IMF first review and a successful review will definitely strengthen our economy. It is not only a matter of getting $333 million as a second tranche, but it will be way beyond that. The message we pass on to the investors, once we finalize debt restructuring, credit rating agencies looking at us positively, all will bring in positive results to the, the economy. Meanwhile, Minister of Foreign Affairs Ali Sabri briefed Colombo-based diplomatic corps on the progress made under the ongoing reconciliation endeavours and the work being carried out by the independent mechanisms. Further, Minister Sabri highlighted developments pertaining to the financial stabilisation measures and steps taken towards economic recovery and growth. A briefing on current developments in Sri Lanka for the Colombo-based diplomatic corps were held recently under the patronage of Minister of Foreign Affairs Ali Sabri. The briefing was also attended by Foreign Secretary Aruni Vijayawardana, as well as High Commissioners and Ambassadors of Diplomatic Missions and the officials of the UN based in Colombo. During the briefing, Minister Ali Sabri said the meeting was a continuation of regular briefings organised by the Ministry to share information on current developments in the country. Several key developments were highlighted by the Minister, including financial stabilisation measures and steps taken towards economic recovery and growth. Further, the current status of legislative reforms, including the adoption of the anti-corruption bill, the proposed truth-seeking mechanism, as well as the proposed anti-terrorism bill were outlined. Minister of Foreign Affairs also emphasised on the salient points of the statement made by the President on the 9th this month in Parliament pertaining to the 13th Amendment. The Minister also presented a summary of the progress made under the ongoing reconciliation endeavours and the work being carried out by the independent mechanisms. In the meantime, Foreign Secretary Arun Vijayawardena outlined Sri Lanka's ongoing participation in multilateral fora, including Sri Lanka's constructive engagement in the fourth cycle of the Universal Periodic Review, as well as the review of Sri Lanka's report under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. She also highlighted the nation's ongoing engagement with the UN, including Sri Lanka's participation in the upcoming 54th session of the Human Rights Council. The Foreign Secretary also highlighted the upcoming fifth forum of Ministers of Environment Authorities of Asia-Pacific, which will be held in Colombo from the 3rd of October 2023, and the upcoming Indian Ocean Rim Association Ministerial Meeting, scheduled to be held on the 11th of October 2023, where Sri Lanka will assume the chairmanship of the organisation from 2023 to 2025. Join us on the other side of the short commercial break for more news. Gonda Mata Perani Karana Bala Pudu Ankarya Mahindra Juvo Timo Vithin Vendama Godai Godama Tamai Swaraj Tractor Timo Vithin Welcome back. Now Sri Lanka's stock market indices closed in red today as a result of price losses in counters such as Commercial Bank, National Development Bank and Sampad Bank with turnover crossing 4.1 billion rupees. High net worth and institutional investor participation was noted in Agalavata Plantations, Melstacorp and Sampath Bank. 
Mixed interest was observed in Haley's Fabric, Capital Alliance, and Central Finance Company, while retail interest was noted in Pan Asia Banking Corporation, Commercial Credit, and Finance and Brown's investment. Foreign participation in the market activity remained at subdued levels, with foreigners closing as net buyers. Meanwhile, looking at the weekly performance of the market, the ASPI and the S&P Sri Lanka 20 lost 1.7% and 4.5% respectively, while recording an average daily turnover of 3.86 billion rupees. Diversified financial sector was the top contributor to the market, with the sector index gaining 2.64%. Now let's take a look at how the rupee fared against other major currencies in the world. Now, Australian High Commissioner in Colombo, Paul Stevens, says Sri Lanka and Australia have managed to build trust amidst economic headwinds. Addressing an event to unveil the new degree programs offered by Deakin University Australia at Royal Institute in Colombo, the Australian envoy stressed that education remains a core pillar in the Sri Lanka-Australia bilateral partnership. An event to unveil a Bachelor of Science degree in Software Engineering and a Bachelor of Science degree in Data Science offered by the Deakin University in Australia at the Royal Institute of Colombo was held recently. The BSc in Data Science will be a three-year program while the BSc in Software Engineering will be a four-year course. The education relationship between Australia and Sri Lanka is a core pillar of our bilateral partnership. As far back as the 1950s, Australia provided scholarships to Sri Lankan students under the groundbreaking Colombo Plan, which built a legacy of friendship, cooperation and academic exchange which continues to this day. And today there are over 30 Australian education providers operating in the Sri Lankan market. They have built. Australia is among the top destinations for Sri Lankan students studying abroad. In fact, there are now over 12,000 Sri Lankan students taking advantage of Australia's high quality tertiary education offering. In these current times of economic headwinds and strategic uncertainty, our two countries have built a partnership of trust and respect, and there's potential for even stronger growth ahead. Edith Kwan University in Australia declared open a full new degree accrediting campus in Colombo. With the newly opened campus, local and international students can now study Australian university programs in disciplines as diverse as biomedical sciences, cybersecurity, design and commerce at multi-level purpose design campus from their first year of study. ECU also announced the launch of a new engineering degree in 2024, which will give engineering students access to three large engineering laboratories, including an electronic laboratory, an industrial control laboratory, and a power laboratory. Now, oil prices look set to close down this week following seven weeks of gains as China's economic woes eclipse signs of tight supply. The seven-week upswing in prices galvanized by supply cuts by the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and Allies was the longest streak for both benchmarks this year. Brent futures rose by about 18% and West Texas Intermediate crude by more than 20% in the seven weeks leading up to the 11th of August, with prices hitting their highest level in months. The benchmarks paired some gains this week, slipping more than 3%. Prices were little changed today, with Brent crude slipping 21 cents to $83.91 a barrel as of 10.33 a.m. GMT, while WTI edged 9 cents lower to $80.03 a barrel. China, the world's biggest oil importer, is seen as key to shoring up oil demand over the rest of the year. But the country's post-pandemic recovery has been sluggish, weakened by tepid domestic consumption, faltering factory activity and ailing property sector, raising concerns that Beijing will not meet its annual growth target of 5% without substantial stimulus measures. 
Data showed that U.S. crude oil inventories fell by nearly 6 million barrels last week on strong exports and refining run rates. Weekly products supplied, a proxy for demand, rose to the highest since December. Another factor weighing on prices are concerns that the U.S. Federal Reserve is not quite finished with hiking interest rates to tackle inflation. Higher borrowing costs can impede economic growth and in turn reduce overall demand for oil. And with that, we wrap up tonight's edition of Other Than First at Night. Thank you. Have a great night.